Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Don Armstrong. Um, I am a uh, technical training manager with Novo Solutions. You can see I've got some certifications there. I'm CHTM, CBET, and I recently just passed the CAB T. I really wanted to take that because I do a lot of training with uh, our in new, brand new Biomed ones, and I keep pushing them take the CAB T, take the CAB T, take the CAB T. And one of them came back to me and they said, Have you taken it? I'm like, I'm ready CBET CHTM, but I thought, why not take it, right? So I signed up for it in the morning, paid for it in the afternoon, and took it at night. It's one of those exams you can actually take in the evening, right? So how effective is your HTM program? You can see it's got a little bit of a question mark at the end of it. This is hopefully we'll be able to engage you in conversation. This is not a one-size-fits-all type of conversation, right? So here's me, Don Armstrong. Been in the industry for about 40, 41, coming on 42 years. I started when I was 22, so you can do a little bit of math there and realize I'm in my early 60s. Loved every second of it. I'm a, currently a manager at uh, Renova Solutions. I'm very lucky in this career. I get to share my gift of servitude uh, daily. So I've always loved it. It kind of fits me as a, fits me like a glove, right? I love the HTM field and what it's done for me and my family. I met my wife. My wife is a nurse executive. Um, and she had a 10-year-old son, which now he's my son all these years have a granddaughter which i probably would have never had a granddaughter otherwise you know i worked at stanford healthcare i worked at ucsf and ge healthcare again all great positions i teach the cbet review course with dave scott who's kind of wandering around here also we teach that um, in fact we're in the, in, the, in, the, in the april setting right now our spring cbet review course online it's a, a two day two nights a week uh or certified already i've been on the tmc i've been on the editorial board bit past president of HTM Texas, and there's the kind of all the different places I belong, along with some Southern Florida and Central Florida Association. So that's a little bit about me. So I've been in this industry for a long time. I've gone over this, how effective is your HTM program? With a lot of different uh, viewpoints, a lot of different perspectives. But now I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague and friend, Isabella. Thanks, Don. Gonna have to multitask here. I'm right-handed, so I'm gonna use that. <laughs> Um, thank you all for coming. First and foremost, we appreciate having actually a full house, which is great. Uh, hopefully, uh, this will be a stimulating presentation. Uh, as Don indicated, we have slides. Uh, we'll try and get through them relatively quickly because at the end, we do have some discussion points and obviously uh, trying to get to learn from you what your experiences are. You will probably see a lot of things that you already do, but as I always say, um, which is a good thing, right? Because it's kind of validating that we're doing something well. But at the end of the day, we hope that at least there is maybe one, two, maybe three things that are unique that you will learn today that hopefully you can take back to your own institutions and implement. So that, that would be a success to us. But at the same time, we hope it will be engaging presentation, even though we have some discussion at the end. If you do have some questions or wanna bring up something or there's some hot topic that triggers uh, that is triggered by some of the things you see on the slide, please, please uh, jump in. We're, we're here to have a very, very engaging conversation. So um, so with that, I want to read all through all this. Uh, hard to follow Don's act with all the, what do they call that, alphabet soup, right? With all the C, C, C's behind his name. But just quickly in terms of uh, who I am and what I do now, um, I manage two uh, departments and two different hospitals that is, um, Cedar sinai Medical Center in the Beverly Hills, LA area, as well as Huntington Hospital, um, actually now called Huntington Health in the Pasadena area, which is also in the LA area, Southern California. Uh, this came about, and I'll have some slides about that, but this came about about two and a half, three years ago now, when both of our hospitals affiliated. It created an opportunity for me to manage both clinical engineering departments. I have in the past, and let me see if I can the laser here, uh, been very involved in, and try as much as I can. I, I do have a husband and three boys and a dog, so very male uh, dominated in, in my household, but keeps me busy, but at the same time still cherish the days when I was able to get more engaged in ACC, I see Sully, so I better say ACC. Uh, and also, you know, very much involved in Amy, HIMSS, and some of the other organizations. Um, was lucky enough to pass the CCE, uh, so joined the C, C alphabet soup, um, and then some other degrees. Uh, I am originally from Poland, probably detect some of the 
the accent, but have lived in South Africa for many years, which is where I graduated with my uh, bachelor's in electrical engineering. And then my family moved over to uh, Connecticut, which I was lucky enough to get into the UConn program. Uh, some of you may know something about the UConn program. Uh, it still continues to, um, to drive very strongly. We have uh, Carol Smith Davis, who is uh, managing that program right now. I think she may not be here at this conference. Oh, yeah, because I saw her name, but I also heard that she is not able to be to be here. Uh, but uh, obviously, continuing uh, to flourish that program, and then my business degree. All right, let's proceed. Ooh, on stays again. All right, so we'll we'll go through those quickly because you see that in your program as well in terms of what we're here uh, to talk about. I talked a little bit about that already. We obviously have a question mark behind it because uh, we want to talk about it, right? We want to see how effective your HCM programs are. So we'll hit some of the traditional indicators, mostly in uh, down slides. We'll talk about some of the you know KPIs and some of the things that we traditionally do, maybe some things that we don't do traditionally, kind of thinking outside the box. Uh, what I will cover, which is going to be the first part of the presentation, what I call the the soft part of the effectiveness of the department, and, and a lot of it is not just operations, but also the people, staffing and so on, which at the end of the day, if we don't have staff, we're not going to be able to measure any of the fancy, <clears throat> fancy KPIs that we come up with. So uh, just some objectives, again, you know, talking about what I mentioned, the KPIs, looking at your MEMP, uh, you know, the traditional things around policies and procedures, metrics, um, and then obviously, last but not least, looking at you know the financial considerations, which obviously continues to be a big deal. So just a little bit on the agenda um, background, we'll talk about some traditional HPM programs, healthcare trends. Uh, we'll dive into some of our individual departments, and since I represent in-house, uh, Don obviously is more of the the third party, as he indicated through his introduction. Um, Again, giving you a little bit of different perspectives and, like we said, sharing your experience at the end. So, again, traditional HDM programs, I think you're all familiar with the stuff that we track on a regular basis, right? No rocket science um, in terms of, you know, PM, CMs, your repairs, unscheduled repairs, obviously, productivity, labor costs, or anything re related, obviously, to budget. Uh, total inventory, who doesn't track that, right? Um, the cost of maintenance, um, not just the cost of maintenance when it comes to, you know, the, your uh, cost service ratios, purchase ratios, but also service contracts, which I'm sure many of you touch on, hopefully to some level, get involved maybe from the very beginning in terms of negotiations, or maybe at some point, hopefully, are aware of uh, what equipment is covered through the different types of service contracts, obviously, that we can have on medical equipment. And then one of the big things, obviously, we cannot forget customer satisfaction, and we'll dive into things like surveys, rounding. Um, we're obviously a very customer-facing, customer-oriented department, so we don't want to forget about that piece. So a little bit of a progression, kind of from the reactive, preventive, condition-based, predictive. Uh, starting here, obviously, uh, many of our departments way, way back in the past kind of fixed you know, break, break and fix uh, type of a department, you know, went into more of scheduled preventive maintenance, you know, looking at some more intuitive ways of helping us decide what preventive maintenance should be applied other than manufacturer's recommendations, CMMS, uh, which I know we just had a session here, I had to kick them out, um, is a very popular topic, a lot of that going on now in terms of selecting different CMMS systems. And then, of course, you know, the future, which is, you know, probably the future is now in terms of, you know, using artificial intelligence and everything else that we hear nowadays that helps us better predict and also better allocate our resources, which are always very limited. A lot of statistics. We're not going to go through each one of them. Hopefully, you guys uh, can look through the slides, but I'll point some of the interesting ones. Uh, since I mentioned uh, AI, obviously this, this is, you know, growth pattern. So looking at, you know, artificial intelligence and how it's going to continue to grow within the medical device market, um, there is about a 44.4% uh, between this year and 2028. So I'm sure many of you 
have already been hearing it um, when we attended some presentations on selecting new fixed X-ray uh, technology. All we heard was AI, 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 AI. That was, you know, everything on the slides. Um, this was also some interesting data from the Fortune Business Insights in terms of the growth of the device, medical device uh, market projected, and this is by 2030. Uh, but looking at you know the growth rate of 6.1% that's being forecasted, which is obviously telling us that it's going to keep us busy, right? Our our profession is by no means dying or stabilizing; it's growing, and we, as HDM community, need to obviously learn how to support it, because we are being obviously told to do more with less. You know, budget is becoming more and more constrained staffing challenges, which a pitch for the next session. If you endure this hour, hopefully you will endure another hour with us. We'll talk more about the three R's in terms of recruiting, recognition, and retention. And then uh, this was just an interesting slide to, to, to put in here, healthcare technology trends, obviously. AI again, telehealth, which we're already in that, wearables, which I think we may have had some, some discussions there on that, but it's becoming obviously a big topic as well. And obviously, virtual VR, virtual reality. Some things related more close to home. Obviously, this was the big picture, but uh, these are some data points which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, this one is a big one, although I know that's changing, but I, I got that from one of the sites, and it was 1,200 devices average biomed tech is responsible for. But I'm also hearing could be anywhere from 700, 800. You know, some people use 1500, which I think that may be a little too much. But, uh, but also would be interesting to hear from you guys um, if you have any specific data related to that. Obviously, it's average because it can vary depending on what the techs are working on. This one was a very interesting one. Um, actually, came from LinkedIn: the future outlook of uh, the biomedical or VMATs in terms of the growth, the, um, the labor statistics, projecting 13% job growth from 2022 all the way up to 32, so a 10-year mark. So obviously, we need to keep on cranking those biomeds and, and keep on um, developing programs so, so we can actually be able to support that growth. Some future stuff, so obviously, again, our uh, uh, support is going to be more and more needed more skilled labor needed to support the more obviously advanced and complex IT-based applications. And then last but not least, and I think I have a picture of that bigger in one of the slides, we obviously always want to make sure that we have biomed or clinical engineering HTM at the table when we talk through whatever that may be, whether it's budget, equipment, technologies, um, or anything else related to our field. All right, so a few things, as I mentioned, uh, again, won't spend too much time on that, but this is a slide that shows the affiliation that I mentioned earlier between uh, Cedar sinai and Huntington Health. A little bit about the two departments. Um, this is clinical engineering on the Cedar sinai side. Uh, a, again, a bunch of statistics. Um, it is a bigger department, uh, 34 members going strong, VMETs, we have clinical engineers, imaging specialist, manager, uh, support staff, and myself. Um, 33, 34,000 devices uh, reporting to EIS, which is our IT department. On the Huntington side, as I call it, the, the uh, community uh, type of uh, environment, smaller, um, smaller number of beds, but also smaller department to support 12. That includes myself again here, but again, different levels of VMETs, manager. Uh, we have one clinical engineer and some support staff, a little bit over 10,000 devices, 10 and a half, also reporting to EIS. Uh, part of the affiliation uh, triggered a common EIS, so we do not have a Huntington EIS or IT anymore. It all rolls up to the CEDARS EIS. So a few things, um, and I highlighted some in red because I wanted to dive into those in a, a little bit more detail so over the next few slides. But again, in terms of some of the major functions within the two departments, and, and again, I just consolidated um, a lot of the data, although there, there are, there will be 
uh, some differences between uh, the two hospitals. But of course, you know, in terms of the operations, what we do obviously focus on the maintenance, that's still bread and butter. But we are, uh, because again, what you will hear in the next session, putting more and more emphasis on our staff management, um, just because we have, especially on the Huntington side, have been seeing more open positions than we would like to see. Um, that's probably the first in many, many years, but there's always first for everything. Uh, so we're trying to think outside the box and obviously we'll share some of that with you today, but also hope I will learn something from you that I can hopefully uh, implement at our place. So really looking at things like succession planning, training, growth, and so on, and we'll go into more details. Budgeting service contracts is a big deal for us, which is actually managed through, through clinical engineering, but we work very closely with supply chain. And that really helps us to have an insight and be able to be one of the big decision makers on how we service our medical equipment. So first, equipment evaluations, construction, renovation, who doesn't get involved in that, want to or don't want to be involved. Uh, incident investigations, we do have protocols for that and, and obviously have different ways of you know, looking at risk assessment um, that I have below here. Uh, process improvement, we've implemented quite a few Six Sigma projects. Um, I am Six Sigma certified. I cannot say that I'm the guru for Six Sigma because we also have a department that has trained uh, black belts and green belts, but we have been deploying more and more of these principles as part of our different process improvement initiatives. Risk assessments um, pretty much do for a lot of our project as far as you know the root cause analysis, um, AEMs, which I know we're not going to go into that, but hopefully many of you are familiar and are already doing um, the alternative equipment maintenance pro um, programs. And of course, if you're in California, happy to talk more about that afterwards. We actually gave a presentation about a Title 22 waiver at the CMIA symposium back in January with uh, my manager from the Cedars side, because we have applied last year, got the waiver, for a year at that time, applied at Huntington towards the end of the year, got a waiver for three years because uh, uh, CDPH started doing them for three years instead of one year. So, so we're starting to look at ideas of what equipment we can apply it for because that would help us basically get away from the must or the requirement in California that we have to touch each electromedical device uh, at least annually for electrical safety testing. So now we can deploy manufacturer requirements or some other alternative methods, because we know that some manufacturers don't require an annual PM, but in the past, we would have to touch each of that device as long as we could do an ESD. So we're hoping to be able to be creative with that waiver now. Safety initiatives. Um, some of the things that may be unique to us that we got involved, I don't know how many of you have, uh, misconnections, small board connector standards that are starting to become prevalent in our industry. Anybody involved in that? So just recently, um, it's probably not recent, but recent within the last few months, Philips told us that because of the small board connector standards, uh, all the new MMXs and a lot of the, the, uh, the, the attachments or the modules that measure NIBP will now be coming with a new port that will be compliant with the new small bore standard, which also means the hoses associated with that will be different. So we're trying to work through some of the initiatives to figure out, because there is a way to retrofit in the field. Obviously any new device will come with that that contains or measures NIBP, but a lot of the vendors you will see will start complying with that new standard. Alarm management, I'm assuming many of you have some involvement in that, hopefully. That continues to be a, a big deal. It was a natural patient safety goal and continues to be through joint commission. So hopefully many of you have a, a seat at the table for that as well. And then of course, a lot of IT stuff, um, especially device integration, right? I think many of our departments now, if not all, have some involvement with IT or their counterparts or, or have it entirely within clinical engineering when it comes to device um, integration. So some other things, um, trying to watch the time because we want to give the floor to Don. And then of course have some free dialogue. 
Uh, but financials, I mean, these are just common things which hopefully uh, many of you are involved in some way or another, or it's at least done in your department. Um, parts agreements, I wanted to highlight that. I know there are a lot of vendors and a lot of vendors that are in the expo hall that are looking for partnerships. Many of you potentially already have those partnerships or exclusive um, agreements with a certain vendor for procuring parts so you can leverage better costs. Um, those are obviously something to consider as well, especially if you have a high expenditure or it spans over several uh, several departments or several hospitals. Um, scope realignment, that's something we've been doing more on the CEDARS side. And what I mean by that, uh, CEDARS in the past has taken on uh, in the different locations, offsite locations, some licensed, some not licensed. We're trying to go through all that and basically do a little bit of a cleanup and realign uh, back to our primary services that we wanna uh, continue to support and obviously work with those sites to see what other support models can be provided to them. Uh, service contracts, SLAs, negotiations, we spoke about that. And of course, a lot of the, the general uh, plans, policies, procedures. I don't know how many of you we do on the Huntington and Cedar side get involved in different policies outside of the traditional, I guess you can say administrative policies, but warming cabinet, uh, temperature management, power strips, people don't want to talk about power strips, right? I have policies for that still. All right, some performance indicators. Um, so again, all the traditional stuff that we spoke about, benchmarking and uh, thinking outside of the box, talk to your HTM network, which is what we're doing here today, right? Today in the session, today uh, networking within the last you know day or so that you've been here. And of course, even the expo hall, right? Please talk to your peers here. This is the best opportunity. I do that as well to see what they're doing, how they're doing, how successful or what has worked or what hasn't worked, right? We, I don't know, some of you may have attended the, the, the session about learning from your mistakes, right? Let's put them to good use. Let's not think of it as just a mistake. Customer service, we talked about that as well. Uh, how many of you do regular surveys with your customers? All right. Good, good side. This side seems to be more into the, the surveys rounding, customer rounding, other than just the traditional EOC safety roundings. Okay, just kind of impromptu or maybe scheduled even just for your department. Okay, good, good. Yeah, customer service, I mean, teaching to the choir, right? It's so important. Without it, uh, without our customers, you would not be able to survive. So staffing, um, and again, pitch for the next session, we'll go more uh, into the staffing, uh, people management, employee management, and things like that, or investing in our staffing. But training and education. I know, again, preaching to the choir, and it's all budget-based, right? Uh, we would love to send everybody, at least touch each person every year for some kind of OEM training. And I can tell you during any of the interviews that I do, which I'm sure same happens to you, that's the first question that I, that they ask, right? <laughs> what kind of training do you offer and when can I go for training, right? So it, it's a big deal and, and we try and be creative, think outside the box. We even started doing some training on site uh, where we bring the trainer on site as opposed to sending individuals uh, out to training. That way we can potentially do more than just one person, sometimes even up to five people if your staffing operations can afford that. Succession planning, employee growth, big, big deal. That's another big question that we get asked here in the interview. What's my growth road, uh, roadmap, right? And that's even for a tech one. And that's probably, like I said, the second, maybe a third question. They wanna know if they come to this facility, what is that gonna look like for them? Because we do see that some employees don't stay at the same place for a long time, but if we make that investment and provide them with some kind of a succession planning, Hopefully that will make our department more effective and we'll be able to actually play off all those KPIs and other uh, effective measurements that we do in our department. So retention and recruiting, obviously um, another pitch for the session later, but, but big thing, big thing we need to make sure that we're able to actually keep our people and keep our people ha happy so they are performing efficiently and effectively. 
And then this is one piece that's kind of new to our world. I don't know how many of you are actually into the, um, the intelligence or the um, emotional intelligence and support, the EQEI. Any of you have read articles or maybe even deploying some of the measures related to that? Uh, but it's a big deal, right? Uh, as management or even just peer to peer, you know, being able to not just understand your emotions, but how those emotions also impact and how you can influence those around you. Everybody has some emotions, right? So we want to make sure that it's not all business business, that we add that personal touch as well. So things, you know, obviously that you can do for your staff, celebrating birthdays, special events, maybe one passed a certificate or came back from training and hopefully passed that exam. You can celebrate that. Uh, making time, you know, that open door policy that we always talk about, right? But I know many times, guilty myself, the door is closed, we're on team calls, right? <laughs> if you have an office or, you know, a cubicle or something. So we want to make sure that we show to our staff that we're still available um, between all those team and Zoom call meetings. And of course, be patient. Some of our employees require more of that than others. Work-life balance, mental health is becoming a big deal. I don't know how it is at your facilities, but we are actually seeing departments emerging around wellness, mental health, diversity uh, that are growing. I mean, we started at Huntington with one person. Now we have about five or six individuals in that department. And we hear more and more about different kinds of, you know, put your mind at ease. Can you, you know, uh, pause on thinking about work outside of the work hours, which I know that's kind of hard for us to answer that question. But a lot of work is being done for employees now to be able to create a better environment when it comes to that. And of course, securing the table, uh, securing a seat at the table, as I mentioned earlier, having you know biomed, HDM, clinical engineering sitting there when it comes to, especially some of the bigger decisions in bigger hospitals where you're talking about multi-million multi dollar decisions, you want to make sure that you're involved early on in that decision, right? Yesterday, I don't know if some of you were at the leadership summit and we talked about some of the equipment showing up that Maybe FDA approved, but it doesn't, you know, pass our leakage current readings. Well, if we take a step back and we're involved in selecting or participating in evaluating that equipment early on, we would have put a red flag to that equipment and, and hopefully that equipment would have never made it to the PO process, to the warehouse, and to the to the dock. I think this is one of my last slides before I give it to Don. So some of the areas, you know, focus areas, this is general, but can also be, uh, you know, specific to what we are working on or continue to work on at both of our sites, but uh, smart goals. I don't know how many of you, we, we did that a, a few years ago and actually I'm planning on bringing that back. At the beginning of each year, I actually set goals for the department, not for the individuals during their annual evaluations, but for the department as a whole. Anybody is doing that consistently? Okay, a few. I want to get that back because I think it kind of brings that cohesiveness back in the department and maybe helps the department focus on something as a department, not just as an individual. Looking at optimizing scope, workflows, you know, pick, a, pick one workflow in your department. Maybe it's how the equipment gets delivered or how the equipment gets stored or how the equipment gets triaged for repairs assign one of your technicians to a project that can work and bring something back to the, to the rest of the department on a potential process improvement. Invest in your staff without any questions, manage budgets, and put the department on the map. If you're not involved in any of these projects that we spoke about, not sitting at that table that we showed, hopefully you can do that when you go back on Wednesday, you know, go back to your superior or the VP that you're reporting to and say, hey, I'm empowered and I want to participate more. I want my department to be more involved and make a list of things why you feel that you can contribute to that seat at the table. And with that, handing it over to Don, he has some fun slides too. So I want uh, 
we'll start off with a question in the room. Who works for an in-house program and who works for an ISO? So in-house program. Who works for a third party? Okay. I've worked for both. And I've had a great time with both. I worked for Stanford for many years. I see some of my old friends there from Stanford. I worked for GE Healthcare for quite a while. I saw a bunch of my friends from GE yesterday. And now I work for Renovo. And I see some friends here from Renovo today. So um, a lot of the same indicators and some of the kind of things that make an effective biomed program kind of exists for both. But for an example, when I was at Stanford, we had maybe 45 to 50 biomeds, all in-house, all all in one spot, a couple of different offsites, um, pretty solid management team. And we were able to kind of assess what we were doing on a month to month, week to week basis. Now with Renovo, we have over 200 hospitals and we have almost 300 biomeds. So how do we assess them site to site? Yes. As an organization, yes. So I'm gonna kind of go through a little bit of both of how I see this works best and typically how it works typical and maybe there's some improvements we can all do. As you can kind of tear, I'm gonna, I get kind of tired of the old way of doing things. I'm not a big, we're doing it this way just because this is the way we've always done it. Yeah. So there's me, uh, it's a cool picture of me out in um, Salinas, one of the two of the gals I worked with at one of the hospitals there said there's a Boston Terrier painted on the side of a power box. So I have two Boston Terriers, so I had to go out and see it. And there's why, of course, you know, we're GE in, in Stanford. I am really apologize for this slide. I looked, really looked full on my computer, but now I can barely read it. I'm really sorry about that. But this is just a, kind of your key performance indicators that we always use. I might even have a hard time reading my computer here. So a lot of the things that we measure right away, in-house or not in-house, is just how many assets do you have, right? With Renova, we have well over 100,000 assets within our 200 sites, right? They're all in one big database, Renova Live, and we can actually, I can, as a super user, go and look at any device I want to or any site I want to and evaluate it on my desktop, if I want to, right? That's one of the biggest things we look at. So then how many are under a warranty or contract? Is your inventory accurate? PM completion numbers, you know, done, right? You wanna make sure you have your records and your policy so you can explain what your PM policy and records are. Income and inspections record and your policy, you wanna make sure that we're following the information from the CMSs. Rules and regulations for income and inspections. What are your KPIs? KPIs are goals that are fed by your metrics. All your metrics are not KPIs, right? That would be crazy. We have too many metrics to call them all KPIs, right? What are these? UTL, total time to repair, response time, downtimes, probably all part of your KPIs, right? We hope so, but that doesn't have to be, right? How are you doing based on your key KPIs? There's a way to evaluate, a simple way to evaluate your HCM program, right? You lay out five KPIs for your, for your facility or hospital, and then you measure, right? You say, look, we're doing okay. Staffing, productivity, and availability, that's a long conversation, and, and I'm willing to have that conversation with anybody, Isabella is too, but for, what, what institutes productivity and non-productivity, you know? Annual evaluation of your program, right? That has to happen annually, right? Here's some of your KPIs and some of your metrics, right? This is where it says up here, all KPIs are metrics. All metrics are not KPIs. And this is, I can't even read it, so I apologize for that. Lesson learned, right? So regulatory guidelines, readiness. We want to, uh, that's a good way to uh, see if our HTM program is effective is if we could be ready and do well on this, uh, our regulatory readiness, right? Okay, your eight, uh, I've done this with third-party companies. I've done this with in-house programs. Joint Commission DMV walks up and hand them a binder with your MEMP involved in it. They read through it for a little bit. They actually ask you a couple questions and approve the stuff, right? We hope so, anyways, right? Coming to these, coming to these uh, conferences, I'm speaking to a lot of you. I know a lot of you personally going through and making sure we do this correctly. The GE, sometimes we hand and I just give them a GE binder and they'd be like, oh, we get you. Renovo, kind of the same way. Stanford was a little bit the same way too. Right? Having something that makes sense and something that you can actually really speak to, really be able to speak to us, right? Do you have any AEM a a and AEM equipment on an AEM program? One of the first questions that an inspector will ask you, you have anything under AEM and tell me what's all about. about how are you managing it? How are you trying to able to articulate your for the joint commission if you're environment and care, your EMV for physical environment to the crediting organizations. This is a big one we struggle with with the third party company with Renovo. We have to get those hospital policies. 
part of our program is to know what the, where those policies are and can we access them, if you actually speak to them, right? Joint Commission and um, DMV don't really care that you're a third party company. They wanna make sure that you know what you're doing. You're servicing, you have a medical equipment management plan in place, right? I'll just say, say um, with Denver Novo, we do what's called an internal audit. Most third party companies, do this. GE did, I was with GE, I did a little bit of the quality audits. I'm the technical training manager for Renovo, but I do fill in with the quality team to go to certain facilities and do a quality. It is a 96 point checklist that we go through, check off, check off, check off. And it takes about a day, at least a full day, sometimes two days to go through the checklist with our in-house managers. And that's how we could define their in-house readiness, right? Sometimes it becomes like 100% done and sometimes it takes some more. Right? I'll get into that in just a second. But one of the biggest things we have them do is make sure that they have these policies. If they don't, we go to the hospital and we ask them for them. One of the most challenging policies we found is the equipment disposal policy. A lot of them say, we just get rid of it. We retire it and we throw it away. I'm like, well, what about PHI um, sanitation? What about all those kind of things? This is the kind of things that we should, from a biomed program, be able to speak to and say, this is what we do. At Stanford in -house, or your in-house programs, that's pretty simple to do. We know the people, or we know the correct people. I mean, a third party, you're like, geez, I don't know. Find these policies and have them all in place. You see there's a lot of, you can actually read the slides, so that's not bad. Right, this is your ISO. We normally have a department that performs this, right? Audits, um, we audit to uh, to assess the HTMs. That's what we use this internal audit. I'm speaking right now. In-house programs should have this same kind of a variation on this to automatically kind of routinely assess how their department's doing. Other than just sitting at a laptop and running analytics and spitting out a report and saying here we are this is what we're doing you know Let's see what the next slide coming financial strength of course financial strength is a big deal i won't speak too much about our financial strength i'm not an expert on this we just know that we do have a budget all biomed programs have a budget i even little me has a budget a training manager i have to fill out a budget at the beginning of the year and tell my leadership what i'm doing every year and it comes with simple stuff like travel and hotels and things but in-house programs and even our even our um, our programs have to have some sort of budget, staffing, parts, contracts, and stuff. How we do it? Right? And I was lucky at Stanford. I I didn't have to do the budget. My director said, "I'll do the budget." And I said, "Fine, I'll do the logistics stuff." It was easy. It was fun to do it that way. How do you evaluate your budget? That's a question maybe for you guys to see if you have quarterly, you have it every semi-annually, you do it annually. I'll make sure that you are tracking that. Someone in your department tracked it. And the big system-wide hospitals nowadays, like there's some, like almost a couple, maybe one or two people doing a contract management budget. Um, what's included in your budget? Of course, staffing, capital purchases, and training, and calibrating of your test equipment is really important. How many parts you're going to use? Contract management. Does your hospital in-house uh, generate revenue? The big thing you know too. Some of your, some of the in-house programs contract themselves out to clinics and all sorts of things that I can charge to do that. Right? Kind of a good thing you know too. Employee satisfaction and employee and customer satisfaction, Renova does both. You know, we want to know how our employees are feeling and we want to know how our customers are feeling. Um, is there a culture of safety and um, inclusion? Are they open to input from the staff? Again, we have over 200 hospitals. We have over, we have almost uh, over 200 biomets. Some of them are single person sites. Some of them are multi-person sites. Some of our sites don't have a biomet on site. They just are comfortably call and someone goes there. What are your retention rates? <laughs> it's 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 challenging you know it's challenging with that with the third party company because there's a lot of competition out there and out of 300 biomeds or 250 biomeds we're going to have some movement most in-house programs i worked with people stayed for a long time you know i like i personally kind of like that i'd love to get to a place and stay there for a long time for me that tells me the hdm program is pretty good if i want to stay you know do you have employee satisfaction surveys and what do you do with them I had an old manager one time that she would get very frustrated if they weren't all fives and she would want to know why. Why are they not fives? Why did this one get a 4.5? We want this to be a five next year. We're like, well, it's a 4.5. Let's use that. To do it. If you're going to do surveys, have those answers actionable versus punitive. No one wants to like answer questions and say, oh, I'm going to get in trouble if I answer this four. Right? Customer satisfaction number, do you want to make sure that you do that however you do it? Email to managers, postcards out on the floors. You want to make sure you can get those numbers and report them. What do you do with those results? And use these numbers only to improve your department, not to shake things up or not to like 
hold somebody's feet to the fire. That sucks. It really does. Suck. Again, kind of a funky little slide here, and I put this guy on there because I have gone into departments before that at the desktop their numbers look really good, and I walked into the department and I'm like, oh my. You know, you, you, you got to believe your eyes and your ears and your nose and whatever it might be. I walked in and it, it, some of the shops are just a mess. And but on paper, on the database, they look really good. PM numbers are solid. Total time of repair is good. They are losing employees here and there. So I would walk in there, even if their numbers would be like, I mean, what, what's going on here? You know, if I'm an if I'm an auditor or or from somebody from the safety committee or someone from Joint Commission or DUB, and I walk in and the shop is a mess, that's kind of what tells me something, right? So sometimes what you see is what you get. You know, numbers are numbers. Analytics are analytics. You can put in whatever you want, really. You're hoping that truth is, and truth is in your numbers. Is your shop organized and clean? I'm a big believer of organizing and cleaning shops. Biggest real, one of the biggest things you, advantages you can have is real estate. If you have a shop and you've got stuff all over that shop's cluttered, take some time, take a week, take a weekend, go in there and just clean that bad boy up. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Is equipment marked, broken or good? If I walk into a shop, there's all kinds of stuff, roll around monitors in there that doesn't look like it's got a sign on it. It says this is good to go or it's broken, then what do I, I that, at that point, that's a ding for me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check that off as a not passed. So I do my, does your staff, all your staff know their roles? It's important, right? Danny, do you know your role? Yes, say yes. Yeah, very good. Jack, do you know your role? Right. All the people that are working for you in your shop better know what they're supposed to be doing. And I don't say that in, in a kind of rough way, just they should know their role. They should know what they're coming in to do every day. Most people want to come in and do a good job. They do. They just want to know what they're supposed to do. It's pretty simple, really. What is being said about your department? Get out in the floor and listen, right? If one unit says, hey, my biomeds is awesome, and you go to the next unit and say, we don't even know where our, who our biomeds are, there's a, there's a conversation to be had there, right? Your department uh, at the table, we talked about that a lot. I'm big time about that. If you're not at the table and you're not getting an invitation, invite yourself. Find out who's on that committee and go talk to them and say, I want to go too. I'll sit in the back of the corner. I'll sit, you know, I'm not on the safety committee or I'm not on the value analysis. Just go. It's not like a locked door. They're not going to kick you out and say, hey, I'm from Bombard. I would like to just sit in. You know, maybe I could, maybe I could, maybe I could help. Maybe I could just make one comment. I think kind of like take some time and get, get and kind of simulated in it, right? Is your department a place where people want to work? As a leader walking around that shop, you know. You know. You can feel that, right? And kind of want to make that place somewhere you want to work. Find out what it is that's that's driving either a negative culture or a positive culture, right? Is it a positive environment in your shop and you want to know why or why? Give an example. I was an OR bombing for a million years and I loved being up in the OR. The third, second floor had my own shop, disconnected from the biomet shop altogether. Right, our main shop was a place where all the high volume stuff came. Sorry if I'm talking too close to home, but it's too bad. The main shop was a place where all the high volume infusion pumps, SEDs, all the stuff that really no one wanted on. Right, if you were in the main shop, you almost felt like you were being demoted. So I was lucky enough to ask to take over the main shop and leave the OR and come down to the main shop. One of the first things I did is I realized it was kind of a little bit of a sad kind of environment down there they felt not appreciated you know so what's the gift for doing 30 infusion pumps in a day more infusion pumps. no one's saying thank you no one's saying way to go you came and saved our, our day right in the or i got that all the time so i loved my job was that self you know i got i got a lot of resilience out of that right so main thing we did with our leadership we decided let's make that main shop a place where people want to go Let's recognize somebody for doing the, 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 the kind of the high volume stuff. Let's brighten up the shop. Let's clean it. Let's put new light bulbs in the, in the place. Let's brighten it up. I mean, do anything we can, right? So that shop then became not, a, I'm being demoted where I get to work there. So I don't know if that, hopefully that kind of still continues. If not, it still was a good, it's a good step forward, right? I didn't get a chance to point out my cartoon. Yeah, there you go. It's cute anyways. So we got some discussions and some questions here. If you could, as briefly as you can, now I, I just go on the on the premises that I'm not one that just likes to look at numbers. I think analytics are important. 
I don't think they tell the whole story. I mean, how do I say this without sounding um, negative? I don't want to say negative, but if you're just using numbers off a computer, it's kind of not the full picture. And kind of, I, I always say, and in in it's lazy management as far as I'm saying, I'm just going to say it, right? You're just sitting there in your analytics and your three or four computers, and you say that person's not productive and that person is, then you don't know your people. Had a question yesterday in the leadership council, and it, it's a broad question, and I actually thought about it a lot. Like, uh, was do you know your people? Now, what's a good ratio for a manager or supervisor to their technicians? If it's too much, you can't know. You can't know. I don't know if the guys at Stanford back there will attest to, but I think I knew all the staff that I, that worked with me and I you know, would say for me that worked with me. I knew them, right? I knew what made them tick. I knew what kind of drove drove them, right? And we would have conversations kind of based on the, the intelligent, emotional intelligence and emotional portion and all that stuff. But, you know, I just sitting there spitting out a, a, a report at the end of the month that I, don't, I think only tells a little bit of the story. So the question for you is how do you, uh, how do you guys assess your department's efficiency? Come on up here as well. Well, you touched upon this uh, several times. And I think it's important to talk to the customers, to look at the environment, to do those rounds with the customers, uh, that your 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 staff, the people that you work with, whatever you want to call them, right? The biometric technicians are supporting. Now, I have seen some outstanding technicians that don't have a name uh, up on the floor, and and they still are easily recognized. They're like, oh, that's our biomet guy, but for some reason they don't know it's Brian. So don't don't discount that they don't know who their biomed tech is if you've got an assignment or an assigned area because it sometimes happens that the staff this is, is like we rely on them i know the guy he's always up here when i need him and sometimes when i don't but customer surveys and and i assume i'm going to ask this but does renovo do when they do their quality audits do you talk to their surveys or to their customers? Okay. Well, so I, I take those, the toilet example, maybe not that, but when they call Biomet and it's really an IT problem, I tell my staff, because I believe this, that that's a, quite a compliment. And then we, then we hopefully refer them to the right people or bridge the gap or whatever that that is to make it seamless but it's quite a compliment now i know a lot of people will say man it's not us that's it that's the plumbers right and it's like well why did they call you because they rely on you to be the source to be helpful right because you're not the one that says that's not my job and then just hangs up the phone So the main two two um, metrics that I know that hospitals and departments have used in the, in the past is PM completion numbers and uh, employee productivity. How many of you are tracking pro, uh, employee productivity? I'm glad. I'm kind of glad that's that's a that's a small-ish number. I mean, we do too. I mean, we we know we can, and we don't obviously all the time because you know we don't want to be chasing our tails around. So Again, hours worked versus hours documented, pretty typical, pretty typical standard, right? You get somebody who's underperforming, you have a benchmark of 70 or 80%, and if, if they're not above that, you can start to have a conversation with them or find out, right? PM completion numbers, if I assign, if I assign uh, one of my technicians 100 PMs, at the end of the month, I expect them to get 100 of them at least completed or managed, right? Following the, the CMS's ruling seven or eight years ago. And then we want to find out, what's that? For the rounds, for the rounds too. That's, that's great. I like that. We win the round. We win the pass that survey. I'm positive for that. We have a rounding call, and then we, when we find foundies, we have a regulatory uh, work order type. 
So, so we, we differentiate from that. about first building the team as a whole every monday we get together quick meeting in the shop we start from the seventh floor of the hospital the nurses see us you know the staff see us at times they don't call you know but we call it get fit walk you know so it's promoting something for the, the staff but at the same time exactly we are using it to um the pumps that are supposed to get the drug libraries they're sitting in the back room somewhere we plug them in you know to help the nurses staff and equipment that are broken we bring it down to the shop and repair them we we are there yep okay doesn't you have something else well i i did but then this inspired me to to say this and i i i like this i would take my staff on those eoc rounds for a couple of reasons they need to be able to replace me, right? That, that's, that's, that's key, right? Not just as a backup someday, but they need to be my boss someday if that's what, if they're gonna be the best boss that I can work for. But I would take the staff and I'd mix it up. Sometimes I'd take the staff that was assigned to those areas or floors on the EOC round so that they could see all the other things that we were looking at from the EOC rounds ceiling tiles, et cetera. Um, and it would teach them to look at the entire environment a little bit more broadly and widely and then report service issues. And then I would also mix it up and I'd take the other tech, right? Or another technician that didn't normally go into that area to see it. And I, this is a little hypothetical, but I believe that that is a showcase to your peer of how well you're doing in that area, right? If you know your peer is gonna walk in and be part of the EOC rounds, my thinking is you're hopefully gonna be very proud of it, but there are some that might say, well, I, I better do a good job because Dustin brings, brings the other guy around and now they know I'm maybe not working as hard, right? Um, actually, it's something that triggered you know, when you talked about the the organization of the department, you know, taking a weekend or after hours, whatever that may be. I don't know how many of you are able to, because I know it's all budget related too. But reward them pizza, pizza, or you know, buy them a cup of coffee or something if they did a, a good job. Um, I think those are sometimes I feel like even something so little can go a very long way. That's great. Yeah, that's great, great. <laughs> yeah. So is there any other, any other metrics we kind of missed? I know we kind of, we did a lot of, like, people tried to throw a lot of context on these numbers to make it look something more than just numbers, right? We got people involved here, you know, with our departments. 
to make sure that they're they're having happy and having a good time and being being productive at work, right? Us as managers, we and leaders, we have to be able to project if our department's doing well or not. Do we need more people? Not too many people in this room are saying they're gonna say they have too much people. Okay, that's gonna be the case, right? Isabella put up that old school, old time, and it's not your fault. I mean, it's just kind of a, always been the way the 15, 1200 piece of equipment for technician. That's kind of gone, kind of, kind of come and gone over the years because now with the AEM and we don't really PM everything anymore that like we used to, you know, you get 20, 20, 80 hours a year to work, you know, you're hopefully you're getting some productivity out of them. I've seen some busy departments literally say, I'm just tracking who's here and how many hours they're working a day. That's all I can do. I can't track how like, I just assume that they're going to be busy when they're here. PM numbers are okay, right? You got, you got a hundred, you're, you're hundred percent at the end of the month, either completed or managed. Pretty good, right? It's not the whole story, but it's something, right? Having those daily or weekly huddles with your staff to let them know where you are. Just because I have 12 biomets don't know, it doesn't mean that they all know what's going on, right? We want them to be, we want them to kind of be a coalescent, be a co kind of collaborative or coalescent team, right? If one person's all caught up, you might as well have the other person kind of help everybody else that, that isn't caught up. And all these things kind of really play into it. We want other people to help. Not everybody works the same way. Absolutely. Document our time because I don't know if you guys capitalize your labor. Some may, do you? Your labor? Yes. Well, yeah. Well, that's that could be a struggle because your your uh, hours that you put in and it's coming out of your personal operational budget, your benchmark number is not going to look too good. <laughs> So, yeah well uh, yes it, it depends on your organization how they measure you which in most hospitals probably adjusted discharges which is you know that ain't come for us yeah but uh projects manage it document it uh track the hours so just in case a question comes up you can say well we spent so many hours working on it. yeah and no uh, go ahead. Well, historically in our organization, um, we had the premise that 80% of your time needs to be documented, right? Well, then I got into trouble with finance because finance would come in and look at your productivity and say, you're 80% productive, you need to cut staff. And reality was we were 100% productive. We were doing things not associated with the repair, but that were productive to the organization, projects, rounds, training, anything that you know associated with what you need to do to do your job and so what we came up with and we designed was what we called codes for defined productive time it's not productive time and say of turning a wrench but it's productive time to the organization we sat down we looked at all those codes we developed them and then we required our technician if you work eight hours a day you need to document eight hours of time and that time can either be productive or defined productive time it's not unproductive time, it's defined productive time. We started reconciling that with the organization. The data we started getting from that, how much time are we spending in projects? How much time are our technicians doing training? Who's rounding more, who's rounding less? A lot of that information became valuable to us and actually helped us improve what we were doing within our department.
Thank you. Uh, I have a question for everyone here. Uh, I never understood and have not been able to find any definition of productivity based on time documented. It seems to me that there is something wrong with this whole concept. We are apparently giving prices to people who are slow in doing their things. If you own a widget factory, do you measure your workers' productivity by the number of hours they work or the number of widgets they produce? Take a look, for example, at the, the Department of Labor's Bureau of Standards, uh, Labor Statistics, and see what, how they define productivity. You hear that they say productivity in the United States has increased in the last decade by so many percent, et cetera, et cetera. But it's because they are looking at the time people work or something else. I think you, folks need to take a look because I cannot possibly understand why we bother to measure time that are self-reported and has no verification whatsoever. Okay, so take a look. Maybe I'm being dumb here. Just let me know, please. Thank you. I would always say it doesn't take much. Uh, not not You don't have to be a smart biomed to document eight hours every day. You know, I could put two hours on form fusion pump modules and I got eight hours and I'm a superstar. My colleague next door is busting his butt and he's, he's, he could only put down six and a half. So I'm better than that, that person. If I don't know as a manager what, what they're actually doing, then I, I'm kind of just throwing stuff to the wind, right? So 